Good morning and welcome to this week. Scott, how are you? Doing well, how are you, Joe? I, I am staying at home and when the sun comes out, I'm pissed. I wish for rainy days because then mm -hmm. I won't feel so cramped in here and not able to get out, you know, which is, uh, I don't know, I, I shouldn't be like that, but the sun is shining today and it is a little bit brighter but it's really important to try to flatten that curve to yeah. reduce the rate of uh, infection in the country. You know, I'm in New York City and, uh, you know, I think uh, there was a big spike in deaths last night. But the good thing is that the rate of infection um, is only doubling every four days up until a few days ago. Uh, Cuomo said that it was, uh, doubling every two days. So they've been able to, I didn't see his uh, presentation press conference yesterday, but I hope that that pattern has continued, which would indicate that a, the rate of infection is slowing because we're here in the epicenter of the uh, crisis, you know? Yeah. So everybody stay home. Don't do nothing crazy or stupid. You know, we got to get control of this thing. And it's, I mean, in some sense it's, the news seems to be encouraging because it looks like in the the sort of areas where it's where infections have surged so far in, in China, in Italy, in New York, um, the surge lasts for um, a couple of weeks and then um, uh, flattens off and and um, and the crisis is a little bit mitigated. Mm -hmm. uh, the difficulty is in a place like the United States. You know, we have 50 states that are uh, in, in, in some sense close to 50 independent countries. And, you know, if you have people coming, uh, you know, New, the, the people of New York are, are staying home, staying inside. Um, other states have different uh, parameters for their response. No uniform uh, plan, is that what you're saying? No, no uniform plan. So if you get somebody from a state where, where infection has been less well controlled, traveling back in, um, you know, then, then it, it increases the risks. It really what about added. Trump? Now he wants to open up the country uh, by Easter. He said, Jesus Christ resurrected one person. I'm going to resurrect a nation <laughs> on Easter. Did huh? he actually say that or is that, or is that your... Uh, uh, I don't know. I saw an impersonation of him. This oh, morning. okay. That, was, that, was just that, that seems a little far, a little far even for him. But, I don't uh, know. We'll have to we'll, we'll have to check it out. Anything's possible, but they're trying to put together a national plan to uh, county by county uh, assess the level of risk um, and uh, you know reopen it in places where there's allegedly low risk and, and all of that kind of thing. But the governors are fighting back and uh, properly so um, because this outright approach, and that's what it is to the governing uh, that the president has is, you know, wrecking havoc uh, and costing people lives, you know? Well, it's also, I mean, you see, so uh, it makes me think of, of what um, uh, Toliati said about um, fascism, all of its policies, all of its ideology is only in the service of creating the movement necessary for a fascist takeover. And you can see very transparently that Trump's entire response is based on, um, you know, needing to appear as the person who has restored normalcy needing to appear um, in the electoral context, but also in a broader kind of uh, uh, building that, that, that Trump GOP uh, fascist movement as like the savior of the, of the country and whatever. It's ridiculous. He's yeah, you know, putting all of us at risk for- It's a movement, uh, yeah, you're right. All of us at risk and it's a movement based on unreality and denial of the uh, severity of the uh, problem because the workers on the front line are catching hell. I think there were like 130 deaths in Boston of, of, of hospital workers uh, yes. so far. And I've got, uh, a, I've got a friend who, who works at a grocery store and who's on uh, just about every day on Facebook, she posts, you know, please, you know, try to 
don't everyone go to the grocery store every time you need something. Send one person, do your, uh, do your shopping, you know, one person for the group. Limit your, limit your, you know, time in the store. Like we're, we're getting sick because, you know, we're on the front lines of this thing. And, and she's right. right. You know, the sure. working class is, is making huge sacrifices to keep this country going. Um, and it's those sacrifices need to be uh, respected and, and compensated and people need to be protected. And you know, there's a racial and sexist, uh, a racist and sexist dimension to this because according to what I've read, a lot of the workers, if not most of them who are still out, who are not able to go home working in the service industry are black and brown. Mm -hmm. And, and healthcare is is very predominantly um, women. Yeah, there's a special impact there as well. So um, and 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 we are the ones who are least able to, uh, because of our already compromised health outcomes. We are the ones who are most uh, and health status uh, uh, capable of you know addressing uh, and responding to. We got compromised health, our incomes uh, ain't what it need to be. We ain't got $400 in the bank in case of an emergency. We're living paycheck to paycheck. And speaking of which, what do you think about that package that the Senate passed and that's now gone into the House uh, to you know, deal with the crisis? Is it enough? No, but I mean, we have to start by, by saying a couple of things. Um, if you compare this to the response in 2008, you can see kind of what has been happening, the, the building power of the working class movement and the, the people's movement over the past decade. Um, you can see kind of what the party has been talking about. It's, it's the strength and organization of the movement that changes things. So we have this $2 trillion stimulus bill, twice the Democratic majority in the Senate blocked Republican proposals that weren't, um, that didn't do enough, they considered as enough for the working class. Um, and finally, they, even as a minority, were able to get a package that expands and extends unemployment insurance, um, uh, that puts uh, congressional oversight over bailouts, um, that places, you know, limits and conditions on companies' access to bailout money. So it's, it's a very, it's a, it's a much, the role of the working class, the, the working class stamp on it is much clearer. And it's not, you know, because all of a sudden uh, Chuck Schumer and, and, and the Senate Democratic uh, group decided that they're, you know, warriors for the people. It's because the people have been able to impose that kind of orientation on, on political life. I think that that's right, and and it's uh, and and it's a step. But what's going to happen when that twelve hundred dollars, I mean, runs out? I mean, that's like one month's rent if you're lucky. And I mean, what's what's and what's needed is a, a package that includes things like, you know, suspension of rent and mortgage payments, and suspension of debt collection, um, and guaranteed access to basic necessities, including getting them delivered for people who can't leave their house. Like the, the, this thing needs a huge response. Um, and I think part of the problem is that kind of the political will or political imagination has been so weakened in this country by, by just decades and decades of, of red baiting and of, you know, opposition to anything that could be conceived of as socialist that it's hard for people to, to imagine that what they know is necessary could also be possible. Well, you know, you're going to deal with a situation, uh, according to the uh, Federal Reserve of St. Louis, of upwards of 30% unemployment. The airline industry is in deep crisis. There are calls for its nationalization. So the question becomes, how are you going to solve this absent something like you know, national, nationalization of the uh, airlines. In other words, you know, just the government taking it over and running it as a public, uh, public company. 
or um, how do you deal with the unemployment rate unless you have like a workers uh, uh, project authority, WPA type program where the government creates jobs, um, uh, uh, you know, rebuilding the infrastructure in the country uh, in order to do it. And, you know, those are like public uh, socialistic like solutions to the crisis. On the one hand. Oh, sorry. Please continue. Honey, you were going to say? I was going to say, you know, even as we as we pursue those, we also have to recognize that historically, um, fascist movements have not been opposed to nationalization of some sectors of the economy. So when we talk about nationalization of the airlines, massive infrastructure and public works projects, um, we should be clear to, to specify that um, nationalization in the interest and under the control of, of the people and the working class. So uh, and an infrastructure project with, with good wages and collective bargaining rights and, and things like that, not just, you know, we're gonna uh, put everybody to work on uh, building Trump's border wall or some, you know, fascist nonsense. Well, here's, that's one aspect of it. Um, but the other side of it is that you don't want to put demands at the same time that are so far out that are impossible of being realized. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, there's a tactical question with regard to uh, what can be done at this moment. You don't want to aim too low. But at the same time, you don't want to aim at some kind of pie in the sky program that that is, you know, impossible to realize. And so one big issue is what's going to happen when the money runs out, when the unemployment uh, benefits run out, what's going to happen when that $1,200, uh, uh, you know, evaporates, you know, after one month, you know, uh, what's going to happen if the virus uh, continues to, to spike? What's going to happen if there's another calamity? You know, there's going to be fires in California during the summer. Then hurricane season hits. What if we get hit by another Katrina, you know, or another big Northeastern that, you know, ravages, uh, you know, North Carolina? You know, it's, it's, so it's important, yeah, yeah, we're always on the, you know, on the brink of crisis. Um, Living in an era of crisis. I mean, and I, I think we should pay some attention to the, I can't remember where I heard it first, I didn't come up with it, but the idea that there's no such thing as a, as a natural disaster. Um, things become a disaster when society is not capable of uh, managing uh, the response to them, right? So capitalism is falling apart. Um, it's, uh, it's on hard times. And all of these events, the, the pandemics, fires, put increasing stress on it, both economically and, and politically in terms of you know, existing democratic forms. So part of this response to the current crisis has to be building the movement to, and, and putting forth the set of demands that will enable us to address future ones. So we need Let to ask you a question about that. How do you build a movement when you got to stay at home? Well, that's a really interesting question because it's it's uh, one that we're going to ask as our uh, discussion question uh, for um, the months of, of April and possibly May as well. Uh, how how do you build solidarity? How do you build collective action uh, when you have to stay at home and even if you're in public, have to be six feet away from somebody else? Um, and we don't have the answer to that yet, um, but, you know, we hope uh, collectively um, we, we- Well, I heard some interesting ideas, you know, I, I was talking to a comrade in Texas, in Houston, yesterday, and one of the things that they're doing is uh, they're organizing caravans of cars uh, to go uh, to the homes and offices of public officials demanding uh, that they address different problems that are appearing in their city that haven't been attended to. You know, I thought that that was a, uh, a, a very interesting idea. Another proposal that I've heard put on the table is organizing rent strikes in, in 
cases where people who are on fixed income or whatever or don't have working at McDonald's can't pay the rent, that the people in the building would go on strike in defense of them. So that's another interesting uh, proposal. And then there are mutual aid societies that are being set up online uh, on a neighborhood basis to assist people who can't take care of themselves, who are elderly or disabled or you know health compromised or whatever it might be, uh, to make sure that they have food, to make sure that they can get to the doctor, to make sure that whatever the contingency is, that um, you know people are uh, responding to it, and that kind of communal, collective, uh, neighborhood social solidarity, I think is something really important uh, for us to be involved in. On the one hand, we got to make, you know, demands on the state and government, but on the other hand, we got to be involved in the day-to-day -day struggle of people, particularly in a crisis like this, in order to survive. And those things are not disconnected from one another. No. It's, they're, they're not at all in opposition. If we think about the history of the working class, um, capitalism, brings workers together. That's, that's the, the real source of profits. Is it just, you know, is it isn't just the extraction of surplus value from you and your neighbor and your neighbor and your neighbor. It's the combination, um, the coordination of all of that labor that unlocks the, the huge productivity and the, and the profit making potential in capitalism. So capitalism brings us together. Um, and that's sort of where we learn to form unions, where we learn to, um, so uh, this, the, these community efforts, this solidarity, this, this, co this collective life is part of what it means to be a working class person. Um, and it's part of learning how to struggle together uh, eventually for, uh, for socialism. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. The process of production organizes us, brings us together. And at the same time, capitalism, because of its pursuit of profit, pulls us apart, you know? So you've got that double dynamic going on, you know, togetherness on the one hand, a separation on the other. But the question is what's primary? And primary is the coming together, you know? Uh, and, uh, but, by itself is not enough. We have to consciously, every single day, organize it, fight for unity, and so on and so forth. Well, we're pretty close to ending the conversation today, Scott. Um, we wanted to develop a new policy of, of uh, by the way, I forgot to say good morning revolution. So before we end, I want to say that we want to answer a question to our mailbag. Do we have one this week? Yeah. Um Someone wrote in uh, asking uh, what our um, what our opinion is on um, uh, the legacy of Mao and Maoism. Okay, well, that's a big question, and um, what we could, one way we could approach it is you know we uh, we also get questions a lot of the time about about Stalin. Mm. Right? Um, so. Uh, I notice you guys talk about Marx and Lenin, but you don't talk about Stalin and Mao. You don't quote them in your in your writings. Um, why why is that? Well, it's a good thing we don't because we've always felt that we have to develop a model and concept of socialism in the United States based on what happens here, you know, and not what happens in uh, some other country. Um, that's one part of it, and what 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 happened in the communist movement uh, is that, particularly in the initial stages in the 20th century, is that because of our newness and lack of experience, we mechanically borrowed from the Soviet or Chinese experience and tried to apply it to American conditions or French conditions or Japanese or Argentinian or, um, you know, Brazilian, uh, Indonesian experiences. And it just don't work, you know? There's no universal models. You gotta develop it based on what happens in your own country. That's one thing. The other thing that you gotta address is 
what were the political practices of both Joe Stalin in the Soviet Union uh, during the uh, period of uh, uh, his life when he was the leader of the country. And the same thing is true with uh, Mao. And in both cases, you know, you have uh, a lot of problematic issues that came to the fore. Yeah, they played a war role in winning the Second World War, you know. Um, yeah, Mao led the revolution uh, and the, the Long March uh, helped organize the Ch Chinese people and party and the peasantry in the fight uh, uh, for the national independence of their country. No question about that. But there were also uh, a lot of problems, you know. There were the trials. Uh, there was the liquidation of the old Bolsheviks in the Central Committee. Uh, there was in China the Great Leap Forward. Uh, you know, there was the Cultural Revolution, which created enormous, made enormous mistakes, you know, uh, and caused uh, significant suffering. But then there's also the issue of the political practice in, in uh, 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 both cases, you know. What re relevance do the uh, political experiences there uh, have to do with our uh, experience here? Like, you can't take uh, power comes out of the barrel of a gun, Mao's famous quote from the Little Red Book, and apply it to our political struggle in the United States. Sadly, particularly during the 60s and 70s, a lot of young people did, you know? I'm gonna try and take this in a, in a slightly different direction, I think, uh, as a, sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, did you Develop your thought. Uh, so um, I think this question of, of, of quoting Stalin and Mao in particular, I don't do it because it seems like letting the bourgeoisie dictate the terms of our ideological work. So I think there's, there's this tendency in, in, in anti-communism to reduce the entire Soviet experience to Stalin. Everything is just this, this Stalin and how horrible he was and, and to do the same thing in China with Mao. Mao and, and how horrible Mao was. And, and that becomes uh, a kind of cover so, you, so they don't have to actually engage with the, the complexities of the, the process of socialist development, the, the pressure of, of imperialism and capitalism and all of that. So I think on the part of a lot of uh, people in the, the communist movement or some people in the communist movement, the desire to quote Stalin and Mao has less to do actually with what Stalin and Mao wrote than with a desire to sort of push back against that uh, ruling class anti-communism to say, you know, you, you say that Stalin and Mao prove that, that communism is dangerous and tyrannical, but we're gonna, you know, take that up and be proud of it. But that's, that's, not, the, that's not the question. The question isn't, do we, you know, wave the, the proclaim the name of comrade Stalin or, or, or whatever. The, the question is, what are we doing as the working class? What are we doing for the working class? And, and I don't think we should fall into the, the trap of mistaking a, a person's name for a program. Um, our program yeah, comes You from, have to look at the universal experience of the working class socialist and communist movement. And we have to draw the lessons from its pluses and minuses in an objective and frank way. And we have to develop our own way, our own path based on what's happening in our country. I think that's the most important uh, thing. And we got some hell of five thinkers uh, in the United States as well, you know, going all the way back to Debs and uh, Foster and, and uh, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, Claudia Jones, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, I could go on and on and on. Uh, Helen Keller, even, you know, Albert Einstein, all partisans of socialism. Let's quote them. So, Scott, stay uh, strong, stay safe, stay healthy, 
uh, stay socially distant, but uh, mm -hmm. communally and socially close until next week. Our and national speaking, committee speaking is those, meeting uh, on Sunday. Speaking uh, of, of those national traditions and, and staying healthy, um, I saw a suggestion from a friend on Facebook. You know, Yiddish is, uh, our party has a very, historically a very close relationship with um, American uh, Jews and um, Yiddish was one of the big languages of our party in its early days. And I uh, saw so a friend of mine on Facebook proposed that in this time of, of crisis and, and pandemic, um, maybe we should adopt the, uh, the traditional Yiddish um, way of saying goodbye, which is Zai gesund, be healthy. Be healthy. That's the last word. Um, have a great week and uh, be healthy. Be healthy, comrades.